Uh, sp- speaking of the ne- the difficulty of condensing what people need to write, Mark Twain, or, or it said Mark Twain said it, uh, said uh, one time that if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. <laughs> and condensing, <laughs> the, the difficulty of condensing material is often more difficult than just giving material. So in saying, like, here's classical in 30 minutes, uh, hopefully I'm just touching on things, and then, again, we'll do a half an hour of Q&A or as long as you've got questions, um, five minutes of Q&A. And then uh, that'll give us some other possible topics for later on in the spring or next year or whenever, um, if there's things you want to delve into more. So um, these are uh, introductory to the basics. And last time we got together, we talked about Christian education and said that education is the training of the whole person to love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that um, the outworking of baptism is Christian education. We talked about the antithesis and that the fall of Adam put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent so that throughout history there's two people, the city of God and the city of man. And we want to raise our children as kingdom uh, children, citizens of the city of God. Uh, A few weeks ago a lady asked me, uh, her son had graduated from a classical school and she wanted to know, uh, he was having some, I don't know, laments for one reason or another, just personal, I think, and shooting back at his education for whatever he might get out of that. Anyway, you know, why do we have to read pagan authors anyway? You know, this sort of higher position that why should I have read pagan authors if I'm a Christian? And uh, that's a good question. Uh, if we want faithful citizens in the kingdom of God, then why are we reading the heroes of the city of man? And that's uh, part of what I want to address tonight. And I want to start that with uh, a little bit of a, um, well, basically we'll talk first about why the classical model, which will mean a little bit of a historical sketch of what happened in the last couple hundred years to push us back toward this idea. Uh, And then we'll talk about the content. What does it mean in content? What do we do? What's the stuff of classical education? And then we'll talk about the methodology, uh, the way that we teach that would look different from the uh, modern or progressive education. And so first, uh, a little sketch from Geneva, that is Geneva, Switzerland, at the time of the Reformation, uh, to set one historical example of why Christians would use classical uh, methods. Uh, During the Reformation in Geneva, it began to restore law and order in the city, uh, economics. um, the, The city was becoming more and more bent toward doing things biblically. Preaching of the word was done more and more faithfully. People are coming daily. Calvin was preaching every single day in the church. People are coming starved for God's word. And the next thing that happens in a Reformation anywhere in history, and if you look at the church, is that once people are starved for, for the word, uh, you set up schools. And the setting up of schools is an indicator that you intend this not only for us, but for the next generation. And so that's what they did. He turned his attention to the founding of uh, the universities or the, the colleges. And uh, there were two sections to the, the school he set up. One was the Scola Privata, which were the seven grades leading up to the um, uh, to ability to read Latin and Greek, uh, as well as the study of dialectic and logic. They read Virgil, Cicero, Ovid, Caesar, Xenophon, Livy, Polybius, Homer, Demosthenes, Uh, then the kids went on to the next, to the academy, the Scola Publica, where they were offered theology, Hebrew, Greek, poetry, dialectics, rhetoric, physics, and mathematics. And so this is when Calvin thinks, what do Christians need? This is the way he answers the question in uh, Geneva. And the reason I begin here is that the historical example of the church starting classical schools, uh, if you remember, it's always been the historic role of the church to start and support schools. So the schools of the prophets, the synagogue schools in the the, um, intertestamental period, um, from the early church to medieval monasteries, from Alfred's court to Charlemagne's court, from Geneva that we talked about, to Harvard, even to Wheaton and Baylor. Uh, The church has seen her role in education as absolutely vital for her health and future. So that's been the role of the church, has always been 
involved in starting schools. So concerning the study of pagans, Calvin then uh, said this in uh, the Institutes. Whenever, therefore, we meet with heathen writers, let us learn that Learn from that light of truth which is admirably displayed in their works that the human mind, fallen as it is, and corrupted from its integrity, is yet invested and adorned by God with excellent talents. If we believe that the Spirit of God is the only fountain of truth, we shall neither reject nor despise the truth itself, wherever it shall appear, unless we wish to insult the Spirit of God. And Calvin was not alone in this. Uh, through most of the West, classical education was more or less what education was. Um, they've always, we've always, Christians have always used the pagans. Sometimes they've fallen into uh, paganism. That's one of the dangers of, of doing anything, is that you can use it wrongly, and that's been done. Uh, but we should be plundering the Egyptians and taking the best and using it for God's uh, kingdom. Peter Lightheart uh, wrote an essay called The Devil Has No Stories, that if you've not read, is uh, wonderful and really frames this, probably the best I've ever seen it in one spot, just biblically um, framed. He says, um, uh, all story is the imitation of the true story teller. He says this, throughout her history, the church's settled conviction has been that the devil has no stories. Satan is not creative. He can only parody and ape and distort and misshape the true story. Even the stories that the devil appears to have are not properly his. Hesiod and Homer Aeschylus and Aristophanes, as much as Moses and Samuel, are for Christ. We must exercise great care and pray for wisdom in our study of this literature. We must never embrace enemies as friends or treat Greek wisdom, in quotations, as sound and true. Yet it is fully within the rights of Christians to whom in Christ belong all things to plunder these stories and to make what use of them as we can. Because some treasures of Athens, purged with fire, may, like the gold of Egypt, finally adorn Jerusalem. And that's his conclusion to his essay. So there you got the whole essay. You don't have to read it. Now, it's a wonderful essay, and uh, uh, it's worth, it's about 15 pages or so, and it's uh, wonderful. So um, <clears throat> I call this uh, the wrong turn at Albuquerque, if you watched your cartoons when you were younger. Uh, so why are we in need of a recovery? And let me just briefly step over a few of the bad guys and uh, review them. If we had to pin this all on somebody where education went wrong in the West, I think we could pin it mostly on Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Mm -hmm. And um, ironically, who grew up in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, he didn't believe in God's word as authoritative. He didn't uh, believe in sin except for the sin of owning something. If you read his um, uh, social contract, uh, the origins of inequality, rather. He says um, that uh, basically everything was good. He gives this picture of the Garden of Eden, and then he says, then someone said, this is my stuff. And that's when sin entered the world for, for his uh, new, new uh, creation and um, uh, Eden, Edenic myth. So with uh, Rousseau, you get this same sort of thing. He's very much... A believer in nature teaches us. We do things nature's way, if you will. You don't want to force a child to learn anything particular. You let him kind of choose his own way. He never wanted to force a child to read a book. That was criminal in his mind. You just let them choose. This is uh, romanticism or naturalism. Um, if you jump ahead 100 years to Horace Mann, you have um, uh, here's a man who's he has faith in man. He's a true humanitarian. He believes in the perfectibility of man and that education would bring about that perfection or education brings about salvation. So that he trusts salvation to bring about a new age. Uh, and then Dewey, so I'm skipping rather quickly and those are like Wikipedia sketch type, you know. <laughs> so, um, uh, Lewis will chide me in a minute for even mentioning that. Lastly, uh, Dewey regards truth as relativistic. Dewey establishes schools as social institutions with social objectives, so it's cooperation and proper socialization are the mantra. Uh, and this is you know, the big lament over homeschooling. How will they be properly socialized? Because that's what school is, proper socialization. That's Dewey. Uh, that's not, uh, of course, there's a social function to every part of your humanity, and education doesn't escape a social setting, but that's his primary goal, 
learning content was not. And in that sense, public education today is a raving success. It has properly socialized and shaped and um, uh, trained a non-thinking public. They, they do what they're told. How's that uh, song go? <laughs> um, so it wasn't the uh, function of the school to communicate the inheritance of the past, but rather to put him in direct relation to the society in which he lived. He's not to learn by reading, but by living. Do we believe that truth, beauty, and goodness were relative terms? So in these three alone, you see a failure of the modern system and a need for a revival of true learning. So together, we can say that modern education believes that man is perfected through education, which is self-directed and comes from the inside or from, or, or from nature itself. It's not an external thing, because that would be outside of you, and, and uh, God would have to speak to you, and that's anathema for them. And it means socialization. So a rejection of external truth. Uh, so classical education says one should know history, be a participant in the long conversation that's been happening over a millennia, or multi, uh, millennia. Uh, that learning what great men have said in the past means that we'll grow in humility and wisdom. Someone has come through this before and we can be taught. There's absolute truth, beauty can be judged, and goodness has an ethical backbone. Um, just a little comparison if you think of modern education and classical education, some contrasts. Modern education says that every student should attain the same level of achievement. Right? Everybody should be able to gain that. Everyone should be able to get an A. And there's always that pressure to, to lower the bar so that um, everyone can achieve. Everyone should have equal opportunity to everything. Um, classical education says that <clears throat> you want to take each student to their highest possible potential. And that may mean a C. And that's okay, that's great. But you want to push the bar high enough so that everyone is being stretched and growing. Uh, modern education is multicultural, so it's <laughs> critical of the Western culture, strongly emphasizing uh, imperialism, slavery, historic Christianity, and what's wrong with America, a very uh, hypercritical that way. Uh, we say in classical education, we recognize the great contributions of Western culture uh, to America and to the world, including its triumphs and failures, but also recognizing the beauty of other cultures. Uh, modern education is naturalistic, which touched on with Rousseau, emphasizes the math and science, <clears throat> sciences at the expense of, too often, art, literature, and history. And because it trusts math and science, because it's rejected a standard of truth in um, a word from, from God, it has to find a standard of truth elsewhere. And so it looks to math and science. And so it's set up as a new god, which means they'll ruin it. Anytime you set something up as a god, you ruin the very thing you're trying to worship. And so the only, this is why Christianity um, inspired the scientific revolution. It wasn't against it. It's the very foundations on which it was. And it will be ruined again unless um, uh, we have uh, uh, truth. We don't see absolutes in the math and science itself, but coming from outside. So uh, against that, classical education emphasizes the humanities, arts, and sciences to bring uh, a full perspective. Um, let's see. Uh, modern education breaks things into many subjects. Uh, the subjects are usually not connected, and you think of moving from subject to subject, and their interrelationship uh, is not seen usually. Departments in the university, everyone thinks, their department answers all the questions to the world. If you're in economics, everything is an economic question. If you're in history, everything can answer it historically. If you're in um, psychology, sociology, whatever it is, your field is the answer to everything else, rather than seeing the integration. And a, a good chemist knows his history, knows philosophy, and understands theology and ethics, and knows what he's doing with the atomic bomb. Um, Okay, let me uh, move ahead uh, a bit. So the what, let's sit, they talk about the content uh, for a minute of classical education. Um, one person has said that the whole of an education uh, is to sell another person on books. Uh, I remember a few years ago, a few years ago, about 2004, five, somewhere in there, we were discussing uh, in the board and talking about a building. We need a building. For about nine years, we said that. And um, <laughs> Pastor Wilkins reminded everybody, you need a teacher and a student 
and a book and a shade tree in Louisiana. <laughs> but everything else is non-essential. That's the key thing. When you've got that, and any, anybody, when people are really looking for an education, uh, I'm surprised that people will look back past uh, an older building, not fancy. If they find education, they're willing to put up with a lot in, in surroundings. So uh, that's t selling them on books is, is central. Uh, why so many old books, though? And uh, here, let me turn to Lewis, and you've got Lewis, Lewis in front of you. Um, and read a little bit here. Uh, let me start at the beginning here. And this is on uh, this is an introductory essay to Athanasius's on the Incarnation that uh, ninth grade is going to read <coughs> here soon as we get toward the Incarnation uh, season. And uh, so this is an essay that he has at the beginning of this reproduction of of Athanasius. There's a strange idea abroad that in every subject, the ancient books should be read only by the professionals, that the amateur should content himself with the modern books. Thus I have found as a tutor in English literature, if the average student wants to find out something about Platonism, the very last thing he thinks of doing is to take a translation of Plato off the library shelf and read the symposium. He would rather read some dreary modern book ten times as long, all about isms and influences and only once in 12 pages telling him what Plato actually said. Or today we just check Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. so. The air is rather an amiable one, uh, for it springs from humility. The student is half afraid to meet one of the great philosophers face to face. He feels himself inadequate and thinks that he will not understand him. But if he only knew the great man, just because of his greatness, he is much more intelligible than his modern commentator. The simplest student will be able to understand, if not all, a very great deal of what Plato said. But hardly anyone can understand some modern books on Platonism. It's always, therefore, been one of my main endeavors as a teacher to persuade the young that first-hand knowledge is not only more worth acquiring than second-hand knowledge, but is usually much easier and more delightful to acquire. I can attest to reading Plato's dialogues um, is a lot of fun. You get a group of seven, eight, uh, ninth grade students and read the dialogues, give them each a part, and laugh at Plato and how arrogant he comes off. And of course, you know, every argument is so reasonable when he says it and everyone just agrees with him. Um, but they're really not that hard to follow, and it's uh, quite true. <clears throat> uh, let me skip down and read this next section uh, also on uh, sort of a parochialism that we fall into in his warning. Now, this seems to me topsy-turvy. Naturally, since I myself am a writer, I do not wish the ordinary reader to read no modern books. But if he must read only new or the old, I would advise him to read the old. And I would give him this advice precisely because he is an amateur and therefore much less protected than the expert against the dangers of an exclusive contemporary diet. A new book is still on its trial, and the amateur is not in a position to judge it. It has to be tested against the great body of Christian thought down the ages, and all its hidden implications, often unsuspected by the author himself, have to be brought to light. Often it cannot be fully understood without the knowledge of a good many other modern books. If you join at 11 o'clock a conversation which began at 8, you will often not see the real bearing of what is said. Remarks, remarks which seem to you very ordinary will produce laughter, irritation, and you will not see why, the reason, of course, being that the earlier stages of the conversation have given them special point. In the same way, sentences in a modern book, book which look quite ordinary may be directed at some other book. In this way, you'll be led to accept what you would have indignantly rejected if you knew its real significance. The only safety is, a have, is, to, have a, is to have a st standard of plain, central Christianity, Mere Christianity, as Baxter called it, which puts the controversies of the moment in their proper perspective. Such a standard can be acquired only from the old books. It's a good rule after reading a new book never to allow yourself another new one until you've read an old one in between. If that's too much for you, you should at least read one old book to every three new books. <laughs> Make it harsh and then draw back a little bit. Keep in. Every age has its own outlook. It is specially good at seeing certain truths and specially liable to making certain mistakes. We all, therefore, need the books that will correct the characteristic mistakes of our own period, and that means the old books. And I'll let you continue and read this. Uh, his uh, last line that I have to say um, 
here is that um, he says, correcting the errors of your own age by reading outside of your time. He says, it's not that old books are better than future books. It's just future books are harder to get. <laughs> so, they, those would be helpful, too, to correct your own period. <laughs> Copyrights are diff a problem. <clears throat> All right. So the um, reading outside of your time, I think, is one of, one of the most important and humbling uh, things. And at first, it strikes kids as just, these are such weird ideas. And other times, you think, how odd, how similar, and as if I just thought of all these things, and here's a guy you know, 1,800 years ago. I am reading a Quintilian, it has this book on rhetoric, and I think he wrote like the one, two hundreds, somewhere in there. And uh, he's discussing basically the public education or homeschooling. And he basically uses those terms, you know, and you're like, that's weird. Should be talking about that. That's what we talk about. You know? <laughs> uh, moving along, uh, the next thing about the content is that we, we study content of the West. And um, that's because we live, um, as uh, Doug Wilson always says, we live, I'm sure others too, but he's the last person I heard it from, we live along a river and not around a pond. So we're living, there's things coming downstream and those things make a difference. We're not just sitting around a bunch of ideas. They're moving through. So uh, part of being a capable leader, growing up uh, young men and women of being capable leaders and wise and effective mothers, being uh, helpful and informed citizens who know how to vote well would be nice. Uh, and understand, and we need an understanding of the world around us. In modern education, you don't get much history, or at least not much past the last 300 years. Um, because if you think in modern terms, we have evolved past that. What people knew a thousand years ago, I mean, did they even know the world was round? Yeah, well, they did, but uh, we all, those are also uh, falsities have been put back on them because, of course, they were stupider because we've evolved past all that. Why look back? Because we're evolving. Um, you know, Henry Ford's quip, uh, history is bunk. Uh, that I found the whole quote. And this is even more interesting. He says, history is more or less bunk. It's tradition. We don't want tradition. We want to live in the present. And the only history that's worth a tinker's damn is the history we make today. Of course, he said that in 1916, so it's no longer worth a tinker's damn. So, poor guy. So here's Livy, much older and uh, longer-lasting quote from his uh, introduction to uh, the uh, early, early Roman history, uh, the early, early Republic of Rome. He says, The study of history is the best medicine for a sick mind. For in history you have a record of the infinite variety of human experience plainly set out for all to see. And in that record, you can find for yourself and your country both examples and warnings. Find things to take as models. Base things, rotten, through and through, to avoid. I read that quote sometime in the late 90s on Jordan Myers. Uh, she, had a, she was 13 years old. <laughs> and she'd been reading Livy, and she found that quote. I was like, that is so good. And she was already reading Livy at 13, because... So I was embarrassed that she knew all these, had these great Livy quotes. It <laughs> just turned off. I don't know anything. <clears throat> so uh, this is still true. In history, this is one of the great values of, of reading history, is that you have these examples. Um, another quote from Peter Lightheart. Um, understanding the, the, converse, the great conversation. And listen to his description. He says, to be a literate person. Uh, this is a, just a section I've taken out to his uh, description of what this looks like. Knowledge of Greek and Roman literature is, moreover, important to appreciate fully the literature and culture of the Christian West. Shakespeare is full of classical allusions, as are Dante, Spencer, Milton, and the knowledge of Greek and Roman literature enhances understanding and enjoyment of this latter, uh, this later literature. Sometimes the allusions are for comic effect, as when Shakespeare in Troilus and Cressida, shows us the Homeric heroes sitting around discussing whether they'll come off well in the Homeric, uh, when Homer writes his epic. 
Uh, watching the changing interpretation of classical literature provides a window into the changes of the mentality of Western writers and thinkers. Tennyson's Ulysses uh, describes an aging and very Victorian Ulysses, uh, Odysseus who itches to go on another voyage, for it is not too late to seek a newer world. His poem tells us a great deal about Tennyson and his age, but very little about Homer's Odysseus, who is not a restless adventurer, but a displaced homebody. W.H. Auden's haunting poem, Achilles' Shield, uses a Homeric motif to explore the horrors of modern war and totalitarianism. A reader with no knowledge of Homer will miss the most, most of these points of the poems. So you're locked out of the best literature, even that was written in the last two, three hundred years. If you don't know that, then this is all meaningless to you. These illusions are just gone. Um, so just part of enjoying the, the heritage of the West is to be part of it. Um, <clears throat> uh, and we read the pagans also to understand uh, the enemy. Uh, if you don't know the mind of the enemy, then you can't effectively, if you don't know your enemy, you can't be aware of him and fight him. I remember uh, James Jordan once, uh, he wrote some essays on the dangers of too much classical learning. And I was talking to him about this and said, well, we, you know, how do you know that these are dangerous ideas? Well, of course, he's read Aeschylus and Sophocles and Plato and the Republic and Aristotle. And, um, and so he knows the dangers. I said, well, that's what we need is more people like you who have read these guys and know their dangers. He's like, oh, well, if that's what you're doing, that's great. Like, okay, well, good. That's what we're doing. <laughs> so, <laughs> no more problem. Uh, but there are a lot of schools who fall into the temptation of, of sitting at the feet of Aristotle rather than listening, because uh, he's got a lot to say that's good and true, but listening with want, with always a, a deep commitment to scripture and the ability to read and discern what is true and false. Now, this is also why you don't let children read this literature on their own. They need to be guided. You know, just say, hey, classical education, here's some great old books. Well, these are powerful books. They've changed the whole history of the West. Um, and not all for the good. Uh, Plato's Republic has probably done more damage than anything else. This is, I mean, this looks like Hitler's regime. Uh, statism. Um, people quote Republic as some grand, uh, something to look to as a, as a model. Um, that's, they're, they're getting it seriously wrong. But you have to read it to see that Hitler is following this plan. And that's why you have to be conversant. So we study the West to understand Christianity also. Our story, Christ came into a Roman world, and the book is an ancient book. If we're going to be serious about understanding the Bible, then we need to understand the context of that Bible. Not only that, if the Bible is the only ancient book you have read, you will not read it like an ancient book. You'll try to read it like a Max Lucado devotional. Which is not. <laughs> but if you understand the times in which the New Testament is written, uh, then you won't think that we're in the end times now. You will not be suspicious when you're told that the Bible contains ancient literary devices and that they're important because you've seen them already. You've read ancient literature, and of course, they use chiasms, they use all these structures. No one says, well, there's a chiasm here, and you have to point this and this. And you're going, what is this voodoo stuff you're doing at the Bible? <laughs> <laughs> That's just ancient literature. But if you've never read ancient literature, then you don't know how to read the Bible. To that degree, you're locked out of the ability to read it wisely. Um, you'll see, uh, Dorothy Sayers mentions uh, this one time where she was reading as a child. She had this children's um, Herodotus. That's what she read when she was growing up, the children's Herodotus. And so she knew all about Cyrus the Great. And she's reading then in the Bible, she's like... <clears throat> How did Cyrus the Great pop into the book of Esther here? You know, she just, and those two worlds collided, and that's the first time she said she recognized that these were not, this is not the holy book, and then here's history. This is, this is a real guy, and that was all connected for her. Um, that's the kind of thing that um, I'm noticing. When I tell these things to our kids that have come up through the school now, they're like, yeah. You know, like for us, they're like, oh, that's, you know, finally putting those things together. And they've never heard of anything but that. And it's so natural for them to, uh, to see it that way. Uh, also, content, we teach Latin logic and rhetoric. And these are all ways of mastering words. We're people of the word. And Latin is a tool of uh, word and grammar mm -hmm. mastery. 
logic is particular mastery over the, uh, the argumentation and the reason in our words, and rhetoric is the persuasion uh, in our uh, writing and speaking. And so these, these are all ways to, and the world is built by the word, it's created by the word, and words are powerful. Um, so this is all part of, this is all more of the uh, content. Uh, we could go into the trivium. I think most people are more familiar with the modes of the trivium, and so just briefly the grammar, logic, and rhetoric as far as the way that we teach, um, knowing that kids learn well by rote. Rote is a four-letter word to progressive educators. Can't use four-letter <laughs> words like rote. And, um, but it's the way it works, and that's the way it gets into them. The problem is, is that because the progressive educators don't, recognize the image of God in us, and they don't see the patterns of maturity the Bible sets forth in the stages of learning also, it confuses them. And so the common core is adding more and more critical thinking skills for seven, seven-year-olds. You know, they're being told to analyze the math problem, and they're eight. <laughs> well, and that doesn't mean you don't teach them some concepts along the way, and some of them click, and they go, wow, I didn't see that, and it helps them see their tens, and it helps them see the ones. And um, At the same time, though, college freshmen and sophomore and juniors, and maybe even through the, through the undergrad, are basically told to take notes, memorize the material, and spit it back on the test. Um, I don't know how many of you in your four-year four schooling sat around a table and argued ideas and had to answer and, and converse and be pressed on how you thought about something. Um, that's, that's pretty rare, I think, in colleges today. Maybe, when, maybe in your senior year, if you get into a smaller class and you've got some specialized, but that's almost gone. Uh, so critical thinking for seven-year-olds and then wrote for the college kids. They've got it all backwards. Uh, we love critical thinking and logic just at the right time at 12 and 13 years old. When they love to argue, then you teach them to do it well. <laughs> Sayer says they're already miserable. You might as well be they've been taught how to do it right. <laughs> and actually, it's just worked out beautifully the other day. As soon as we got through the fallacies this last two weeks, immediately, you know, they can all catch each other and, like, you know, oh, you know, this, uh, you've heard kids do this. Burn, like I got you. Burn. <laughs> it's like that's an ad hominem, or it wasn't that? It was something else. I can't remember. Them. Anyway, they're immediately catching each other. Ad hominem, and this and that. So now they're starting to, to be more critical of their own thinking. A movie's not cool just because it's cool. You say, well, what made it cool? Think about why you liked it. I'm not saying you're wrong, but think about the reasons that are there and articulate them. And let's talk about whether those are right or wrong. Or wrong. Maybe you're wrong. But <laughs> that's how you begin an argument, uh, not a fight, but an argument where you use arguments with premises and conclusions. Um, so uh, we can take questions on this just briefly. Classical Christian education is broad, deep education that prepares you to be the best worker, the best neighbor, the best person, because you've thought about the meaning of life, your place in the world, and the mission on which God has sent us, namely the blessing of the nations. We're prepared to go out and serve the nations, but we can't have that unless we have the skills and the understanding of what we're doing here and the ability to go and transform it by knowing what's going on in the world. And uh, so, there you go. Some questions about all that or any of that or... So explain to me why we read old books. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh, okay, that would help me understand the Bible more. So what would you recommend to maybe the moms and the rest of the moms like me with young children? Yeah. So where do I start? Well, boy, you start almost anywhere. But uh, I, I even easy know, stuff to I jump into. To I mean, I, th I, love, I love starting out with, like, the Odyssey. Homer's Odyssey is just fun. It moves along the story. There's a lot of scene changes. The Iliad can be a little thick because there's dense scenes and about 
you know, 600 names thrown at you and all coming quickly and you almost have to chart them out at times. And it's, it's great. It's rich. And the, 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 the metaphors are rich. Um, I think it's just manageable, fun, rich literature. And then you can, you know, like a group of moms getting together and reading the Odyssey. You can talk about the themes and, huh, there you go. There you go. Um, so is there a guide to anything like that? Yeah, that's uh, Peter Lightheart has written a great, he's, uh, it's a book called The Heroes of the Cities of Man, the City of Man, and he's got a, a reading guide on the Odyssey. It's actually his collection of the Iliad, the Odyssey, the um, Theogony, and uh, Ovid, the Aeneid, and so, some of the greats through the ancients, and really teaches you to think through it like a Christian and see some of the, uh, the failures, uh, some, of the, some of the plays, some of Sophocles and, and Aeschylus. Uh, you see like these uh, blood vengeance in the old world. And, and that, the great thing about that is you see it, you still see that today some places, don't you? Where, you know, you touch my family and I'll get you. I'm like, oh, okay, well that's just pagan. <laughs> and you've seen it in, uh, in um, uh, Sophocles, Sophocles, Oedipus Rex. And uh, I know in, uh, in uh, Agamemnon, he comes home from, from the uh, Trojan War and his, his, uh, his wife is taken up with another. And so when he comes home, they kill him. And then she kills, let's see. Anyway, there's, uh, then this, uh, then, I can't think who kills who now. <laughs> anyway, then Orestes, her son, comes back and kills, I guess is it Clytemnestra? At any rate, it's one after the next of this blood vengeance, blood vengeance. And you can compare the Old Testament where there's a city of refuge. Um, the wisdom of the, the Hebrew nation and God's wisdom is that there isn't just endless blood. Well, you killed my cousin. Okay, well, I kill you. Well, it, you, know, you kill this guy. So his next relative, and it just goes on and on until someone forgets about it, or you get caught, or whatever. In the Hebrew system, then you can compare and say, there's a, there's a city of refuge where you can go to the city, and at the gates, the elders can actually have a set-up court and decide. You go to get there fast, but <laughs> because there is an avenger coming, and if you're handed over to him, he's there to do that, but then, then the story is over. Uh, Athens answers that, and that the whole point of this trilogy is to go into pointing toward the humanities, where in Athens there's a democratic, you can get a judgment that's just, uh, and that's their contrasting progress compared, but they'd already ignored the Hebrew wisdom, but this is their way of getting at it, is through a democracy. So. And in the ninth so, grade, it is, yes. we're reading Beowulf, and it's the same thing, it's that, yeah. that culture of blood feud, yeah. and you know, that vengeance, and you, you, that's on you to avenge that wrong, and if you don't do it, your son should do it, and if his son can't do it, then your grandson should do it, and just, but, but Beowulf's interesting, because it's coming at that time where you have this pagan warrior culture, and then Christianity is just on the cusp of coming in, and the, the poet is writing looking back on that, but just being able to see how Christianity completely conquers that type of thinking and that type of mindset, and it was just a total different way of, of them viewing life of a suffering servant and um, a king, a conquering king who would conquer by death, by laying down his life rather than exacting vengeance. And you just, the kids get to see that, that how Christianity really does overcome that kind of pagan mentality. Other book suggestions to start out? <laughs> Watching know. Shakespeare and reading, yeah. it's always great. Whatever you can do with Shakespeare. Yeah, but, and so the best way to do it is reading, reading it as a group and <laughs> I like, I like Romeo and Juliet, the latest modern. I saw that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not. No. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Um, I really like Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
what part of rhetoric do you take and glean from the pagans? Yeah. And then what, how does Christianity <clears throat> look at that differently? So what would our classical education look like yeah. different from Western culture, I guess? Yeah, that's a, that's a fun question because it's um, one of the things I do early on is uh, if you read Aristotle, um, basically uh, the art of persuasion, it's rhetoric. So if you get up and you speak, people are persuaded, then you're a good rhetorician. And then you say, well, then Christ got up and spoke. He would speak to the crowds. And there would be a group in the back gathering and plotting to kill the speaker. <laughs> Is that a successful rhetorical exercise? And you have to say yes, because the successful exercise is a good man speaking well um, toward truth and an obligation of belief. Um, and we expand that definition to take in uh, what true rhetoric ought to be. So, and even the, even the ancients debated that, right? You had the, the sophist who could just argue any point you know, just pay me $100 and I'll argue. Which way you want me to argue? I could do that, okay. Next week I can argue the opposite and I can win again. But that's, and they made fun of him and said that's wicked. Uh, of course, the answer to that was you have to argue toward truth, but they didn't say, they don't have a handle on what is truth, uh, even though they recognized, I think, from natural theology, if you will, that there's a, a goodness, and they got some of that right. So I think they're, they're getting at it, kind of. Um, but as uh, someone said, yeah, to use ancient pagans or ancient rhetoric, so you jack up the house, lay a Christian foundation, but you've got, it, you've got to have the foundation right or you can't use it. So um, Yeah, so we even do, we read Aristotle and Cicero, uh, and then in the second year of rhetoric, we read Dabney's Sacred Rhetoric, and it's an instruction to uh, pastors. But he basically, and he's quoting Aristotle and Cicero and Quintilian uh, all the time and using them and applying them, but you're watching this Christian man go through it and say, well, but we don't do this, and here's why they'd be wrong here. Here's where biblically a Christian would be different. Um, so he does a little bit of that work for you and helps you uh, work through what is a biblical rhetoric. Uh, the other part of rhetoric is not training the kids in speaking and writing well, but is, and to me this is maybe, I don't know if it's just as important, but very important, and that is being able to discern others' rhetoric. So you're no longer a victim to what they're doing to you. You can see through the charade, the tricks of persuasion, uh, when you've got a, a demagogue like our faithful leader or others who, you, you know, oh, oh yeah, no politics. Um, it's all political. So <clears throat> uh, being not taken in by that, that's why we read, um, first thing we read this year is Postman's uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death. And it talks about the effect of television. Television by its nature turns everything into entertainment. So he says something like, uh, I'm not against television. I think it does entertainment very well. That's one of its chief virtues is that it's very entertaining. But when it begins to put uh, religion on television, now you've turned, you haven't turned um, television religious. You've turned religion into entertainment. Mm -hmm. Now everything's amusing. And so this is why it does not matter what's going to be turned on the television. If you have a classroom of students, and you roll in a TV or flip up a laptop, there's automatic cheers. Mm -hmm. We're just going to watch a boring lecture. It doesn't matter. They're going to watch a screen because they know that this requires nothing out of them because there's no interaction. Or unless you pass out, now here's what you have to, oh, no, you're going to kill it. I was just going to sit here in the dark and let the screen wash over me, but now I have to listen and discern and take notes. That's how you, that's how you actually can do something with it, but they just, the invitation of a screen, already they feel like something good is going to happen now. Uh, so I say the part of rhetoric is, is seeing them, getting them to see through it, I think is, because we're not all going to be public speakers um, or even public writers. You want to be effective and able to communicate well, but you certainly want to be able to discern what you're hearing. Now how does, with Geneva, I guess 
really, I mean, is it, it's an active focus on actual reading books in terms of the act, you know, the act of it itself. I mean, you, you know, pulling a screen into the room is the, yeah. you know, it's, it's the exception, not the rule. I guess the idea is it's our, to the children here actually are reading and reading and reading. Is that, I guess that's my understanding of it. Is that a... Yes. Uh, and the pulling there... of the screen in is often so they can watch the president do a speech or some sort of rhetoric act, right? I mean, you're bringing that in as a tool. Yeah, I mean, like once a year. I mean, there's like some, you know, some that <laughs> we watched actually Obama's, uh, one of his speeches you know, about the first eight minutes of a commencement address and compared that to one of J that JFK gave to Reagan, to, mm -hmm. it's just embarrassing to watch. Mm -hmm. It's all about him for, first, right. which is interesting. Mm -hmm. And it's all the shout out to this and the shout out to that. And I was like, I mean, the, the total casual, nothing big going on here. I know I'm at Harvard talking here and I'm the president, but don't get too excited. You know, how about that ball game later on? You're like, <laughs> and even, uh, I mean, Reagan's always humorous. He always has funny little things to say. and. So he warms up his crowd, but then he begins to move toward content and a subject of weight to leave the students with something to, you know. Um, yeah, so we'll do things like that we, because uh, theory, imitation, and practice are all part of rhetoric. And so like uh, we do the pastor's conference in January, and a big part of that is we all sit down together and are listening to, you know, six, seven, twelve, whatever lectures, and afterward we can talk. Sometimes it's about the content, but often it's just about, you know, what made you fall asleep during his lecture? <laughs> uh, we had one guy a couple years ago that just how he killed everybody. Uh, I should say who it is, but it wasn't Obama. <laughs> and uh, you're not recording anymore, are you? <laughs> no one, you know, no one knows him. And uh, <laughs> anyway, he would begin this quote. And you didn't realize, and the whole thing was, you just, end quote, quote. You'd hear this quote, end quote. You never knew where he started and stopped, and he had these long <laughs> things. And it was just like, <laughs> you know. And I was, but you sit through that and have to, you know, deal with that. And then you say, okay, what is it? You know, and then when you get up, and you're like, well, you can be, it's easy to be critical. And then when you get up, say, well, now you have to give a three-minute speech and, you know, keep us with you. Ah, uh, like ah, it's not so easy, is it? <laughs> so that helps them to, they can we can discuss it together and see what really works. Someone who's easy to listen to, and before you know it, they're done. Like, what happened there? Let's talk about that. How did he do that? Mm -hmm. That's not ju doesn't just happen by itself. Mm -hmm. so. What about with you know the younger children who aren't quite at the reading level to read, you know Cicero and, and Aristotle? Do we use old books here in terms of you know reading primers and stuff like that in order to actually teach our children you know, how to read and read well? Yeah, I mean when they're when they're little, the biggest thing there is lots of you're reading to them lots of good literature. So the stories and the con that's where a, that's where your programmed readers, Basil readers, um, Dick and Jane were programmed instead of reading great content, great story with grip and. Uh, movement, uh, the shift was toward programmed reading. And so you lost the richness, uh, even toward rhetoric. Th those are early rhetoric stages, is hearing mom read to you when you're two. That's, that shapes a rhetorician. When you read Seuss, even though Seuss was uh, commissioned for the same purpose, uh, to Sam progressives. He's just a lot better writer, so he still gets a pass because he's so good. <laughs> you got to read, um, or uh, Milne. You know, those. If you can read that to your kids, and you get patterns and and a feel for the sound of how things things should be read that build into you that I think come out later. Is that what you're asking, kind of? Well, I guess more like that side step. curriculum wise. You know, in terms of teaching, like the second and third grade, like the books they read, in the sense they'll be reading old books, but just different old books than the ones that help set Western thought. Or yeah, having... most of the content there are stories that are well told, that fit the era that they're studying in history. 
often or, or can be somehow connected to how to help them integrate the ideas. Um, a lot of what they're reading at that era is children's literature, which was mostly in the last you know, 200 years written. So as far as ancient books, and a lot of the children's literature then that they're reading is also written by Christians with Christian story. And so it's less, there's, there, most of those were written during an era where you told Christian story, even if it wasn't explicit, it's already been shaped by Christendom. And so a lot of those books, I've, a lot of those books are safer just to hand and say, you can read this. Unless you get, you know, once you get into like the Newbery Awards and some of those are, there's some pretty, um, like the Witch of Blackbird Pond, are you all reading that now? Mm -hmm. There's some weird stuff in there, and somebody's got a, you know, they've got an agenda. There's some, uh, so that even there you want to be discerning and how, help the kids to see these things that are being done in the literature. But yeah, this, so you want to, the like best, wrinkle in time. yeah, Wrinkle in Time, you know, these are great story, but there's, you know, there's a lot going on there that you don't just want to let them read nine times and not converse on what's going on. All right. Well, well, thanks. Thanks for coming. Here's some goodies Heidi put together for us. Thanks. <laughs>